Okay, we're going to move into uh, the next topic, which is uh, exception, which this topic is, um, I feel is more than uh, complicated, but it's very important for um, um, object-oriented programming. I, I feel that this is the, the topic that a lot of cases got overlooked um, for object-oriented programming, which is, um, in practice, this is really important subject to make it practical. By the way, it is interesting. Uh, from Monday to Wednesday, I was at a conference. Uh, this conference is the probably the most academic, the most important conference in cybersecurity, which people take a look at the um, uh, new kind of attack that's actually in the cyberspace or whatever, which is very interesting that a lot of this new attack is has to do with pointer of something. So I actually see a lot of C and C++ code, which I, I sometimes feel bad at the beginning. I said, well, if you're doing application, why do you need to learn about this? Especially earlier uh, in the quarter, I said, well, why, why student need to learn about pointer? Why student need to point, worry about memory layout and pointer to the functions? And then I realized, oh, wow, the hacker are, Exp exploiting all this idea and see how they can actually trick a, a system to be compromised, uh, to leave a backdoor, to do a lot of things. So it was really interesting. Now, now I sit there and I, I feel, oh, oh, okay, now I don't feel so bad anymore. I said, okay, to have you guys understand this level of detail, it, it really uh, help you to develop your, your skill in terms of moving into um, the next level uh, uh, job, such as cybersecurity, the detail. So one of the issue in cybersecurity they always have to deal with is exception. But now I'm going to first talk about the, the simple topic. Uh, by the way, I actually listed a few things here about the rest of the quarter. So um, homework assignment number four is about exception. All right, I'm going to talk about the detail after I talk about the, the subject. Um, and and uh, uh, homework assignment number four also lead to a final project. So now I want to put the first two as the first priority. So if you know that we actually haven't finished multiple inheritance and memory layout, okay? But I think this topic is definitely not related to your final project and not related to exception. So I want to push down a little bit. It's important, it's critical, as I mentioned, this has to do with, with some of the context in cybersecurity, for example. But I feel it's important, but I want to leave it to like the last week to talk about this. Okay, so just to let you know. And in between, I would like to talk about templates. So uh, a template, like a template, like a template for a vector or a map, and in general, how do we do the template class? And also, how do we do template function? Okay, those things are kind of uh, um, important topic. Uh, good to learn, but we won't have chance for you to practice, uh, such as uh, homework or final project. The final project, it will mostly based on what you have learned uh, before that point. Okay, so this is the 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 planning for, for this quarter. Okay, so now let's actually talk about exception. So what is an exception? Let, let me actually first show you this graph before I go to the syntax. So um, the left side of the slide, it, it represents a program. So a program has some logic, has some control flow that it needs to follow. So typically without exceptional handling, uh, your program essentially has one behavior. It started with some input, and then at some point, your program encounter either successful finish or you actually encounter some error. And no matter what, the handling about the error or handling about whatever is actually within the same program. So the, within the same program, it's going to do everything they want. Okay, so now that's actually bothering us. Can we always include everything? As a programmer, can we always include everything? Logically, we need to worry about, about a system 
within a single program or single, this is what we call flow chart. And in reality, it is not. In reality, you will realize that we like to have a big piece of program. We like to separate the control, meaning, meaning that I only handle this part, but then there was certain condition, which we call exception. We want somebody else to take care of that. I mean, the other example is when we look at a uh, remote procedure call, JSON RPC, you see that we kind of split the program into the client side and the server side. So split the program into two parts or multiple part. By the way, you can use JSON RPC for multiple layers. So the client go to the first server, the first server go to the second server, the second server go to the third server. That's totally doable. So the, the remote procedure call, in fact, is trying to define the interface such that we can do separation. Separation meaning that, oh, I'm a programmer, I'm a front-end programmer, so I'm only worried about the client. And we have a back-end programmer that they will, they will actually take care of the server side or maybe the server after that. So essentially in our programming, in today's world is no longer programming as a single piece. It's always about, okay, how do I cut it out? And such that I will be able to worry about the part which I know the best unless somebody else is taking care of something else. And that's always have an interface. So such that in JSON RPC, we have to define the spec file. In exception, it's the same thing. So essentially, exception is yet another very important mechanism for us to cut out some of the processing about the information to another piece of logic. So, so typically what we have is we have an original piece of code, but at a certain point, we are actually going to say, hey, this I actually detect certain condition and uh, I don't want to deal with this condition in my little program. Instead, I'm actually going to pass the control to another piece of code who's handled that. And that passing mechanism later you will see is called a keyword called throw. So essentially throw is a mechanism that I said, the programmers say basically, hey, uh, I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Somebody else take care of that. That's essentially what we're saying. So who is somebody else? Is somebody going to write a code called catch? So catch is a code who is going to receiving the object that's being thrown out from somebody else's code. And then I will be able to take care of that at that point. Okay, so that's the that's basic mechanism about throw and catch. So let me show you some very simple example. So very simple example looks like this. So this is, this is a code. Uh, you can think about, this is my code. So I use the keyword try to basically say, hey, within this region of the code, I'm actually going to realize there's a few places there are situation I don't want to deal with within this piece of code called try. And I want something else to taking care of that. Okay, so I can, I can do this. This is a simple case. I will get to more complicated. So at some point in the code, you detect. So, so essentially before you throw, typically you have a lot of detection mechanism. You have the detection mechanism to see, oh, there are something is wrong about uh, uh, um, this this input or this particular situation I need to deal with. And typically the result of detection, you have to put some information into an object. Okay, you have to put that into an object. And then at some point you realize, okay, your detection is done. You already put all the information regarding that situation you don't want to handle. And then you just throw that object. Okay, because it's a try, so it must have a catch. So the catch is going to directly catch to the object. In this case, essentially, your code is a try. 
and the catch code is actually done by somebody else. Okay, in this in this case, you actually will see that, oh, it seems to me try and catch are basically written by one programmer, but in reality, this could be, I will show you an example, it could be easily by multiple programmer in different program. Okay, you can even do, if you, if you learned about JSON RPC, you can even throw a code that's actually going to remote, which you already seen. If, if something is wrong, the client code will actually get some exception. Okay, so that, that's the basic idea about uh, exceptional handling. In, but, but in this slide, I just want to tell you there are three new keywords now you, you have to learn. One is try, one is throw, one is catch. Try, catch, throw. And But they don't have to be in the same program. They could be three different programs to do actually the three things, okay? Try, throw, and catch, okay? So now let's see some very simple example how this work. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna use this example. You can see that I have a try and I have two catch. I have two catch and then within the code. Okay, I want you to actually take a moment to just look at the code and see what what you uh, uh, what you can get out of this code. I want you to test your code readability. What this code is doing. Yes, please. So the uh, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that that's good. Thank you. Okay, so so let me ask you then. I I want to thank you very much. What's your name again? Carlos. Carlos, right? So thank you, Carlos, for your answer. So now I'm actually going to give you, uh, three three scenario, and I want you to tell me which what's the control flow about this uh, catch one and catch two, or maybe none of the catch will be done. Okay, so I actually, I want to give you four cases, okay? So case, oh, I have to write it down here. So case number one, case number one, which is the object pointer is not null. And the tag index is not negative. All right, so let me actually just copy this too. So I have four cases. And case number two, which is object, uh, oh, wait a minute, is, is indeed null. And case number, catch number three, that uh, uh, tag index is indeed negative. And catch number case number four is object pointer is null and text index tech index is negative. Okay, so we have four cases for this two condition, right? Okay, so let's let's look at case number one. If case number one, I want to say which of the catch will be uh, uh, triggered, which of the catch. Neither, right? So the first one is neither. Okay, thank you. What's your name? Suze, okay. Suze basically provide the correct answer that neither of them will need to be triggered. Okay, how about case number two? Which one? The second one 
should be the second catch. Right, right. Okay. So you look at this, the second catch is actually catch what? Is it's a string, it's a C string, right? So look at the type. The first catch is actually a the type is integer. So catch is like a function signature. You want to differentiate the name of the catch, the name of the function is catch. And the, the return tie of the catch is probably void, which is doesn't return anything. But the function signature is saying that the number of argument, which is one, but the type of argument that the first catch is a function with the argument type integer. And the second catch is essentially the character string. Okay. Right. So, so that's that's the two catch function. So so the second one, so the case two is actually the second one with a string, right? With a C string. This is the second case. Okay. Now I want to use red. I'll use dark red. Okay, good. Okay, how about the third case? Third case is object pointer is not null, but the text index, tech index index is negative. It should be number one, right? Thank you. So this is going to be the first one, which is the integer. <clears throat> okay, now this is a, a bit tricky, but this is a very important way to catch this. How about case number four? In case number four, which of the catch should be triggered? By the but in that case, if it's by order, which one? Okay, okay, let me tell you the answer first. The answer is actually second. Execution. Yes. No, the, the order within the, within the try. So essentially, you think about what's try. Try is a flow chart. So I'm actually executing at some point, I hit the first place, which I can I can throw. So essentially, remember we say, what is the exceptional handling? Up to a certain point, I decide not to worry about this more. I want somebody else to handle. So I kind of hand off this to the catch. In this case, because it said throw a new pointer, it will hit this and then it will go to here, by the way, after you handle this catch, it will continue to ask you. So essentially you jump out of the whole try immediately. Okay, that, that is important. That's kind of unnatural. So, so think about this. You have a program with a flow chart and, and then you have a throw. Essentially you move out of the flow chart, regardless how long the code is. And then you stop the execution and then you basically have somebody else take care of the rest of the code. Okay, so in this particular example, I'm giving that, okay, so essentially, I think I have a slide to talk about that. This is the slide. It will look like this. So at that point, you actually jump over here and then you basically continue with the rest of the code. Okay, so that, that's a basic syntax about exceptional handling, try and, okay, any question about this four cases? <clears throat> any question? Yeah. You have to write it so that like your last row becomes your first catch. It does not matter within the order. It doesn't matter in no order. Okay, so, so this you can think, that's a, that's, that's a great question. This two, I actually switch the order, it's okay. So I can have a multiple catch and then just matching with, uh, it's, this is a little bit like a make file. You provide a bunch of rule there and whatever triggers condition, it will actually ask you. So, so this is something which is programming you have to think about is the, the sequence that you, you roll your code in a file 
might not necessarily represent the, the sequence or the order of the execution. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. So, um, okay, that's a good question. Is is how do I do the control transfer when you write the throw? How does that connect? So basically, um, if you throw, this particular piece of code of a throw must be included in at least one pair one try clause. So potentially you can have a multiple, by the way, I should actually do this. Uh, I think that's a good question. I like your question. Uh, what's your name? Jen? Okay, I, li I like your question because I, I want to uh, write a another, <clears throat> I to write another one. So I could have a try like this. And inside here, I have another try. And then inside here, I have a throw. And then inside here, I have the, the first level of catch. And catch should look like this. Okay, I'm actually making it. And then finally, I have another level of catch. So let me use the color. Uh, let me put all this in one color. I will use blue. And the real statement throws here, I'm going to use black. Now I'm going to use red. OK, let's look at the structure of the code. I, I have two layer of try. One is outside, which is black. One is inside, which is blue. So the inner try has a catch that corresponding to the inner try. And the outer catch has basically, if you compare the curly bracket, you will see that which catch will match which try, right? So now the interesting question is, how do I actually do the control when you have a throw inside, okay? So if, if both catch in the inner and outer, they are expecting receiving the same function signature, mean, meaning that they're receiving the same object type, then it's going to be first go to the inner catch. So in, in that sense, if both of them catch an integer, then the sky blue is going to catch that, that throw. Okay, so that's one level. However, this two catch, this two catch might be have a different data type. And therefore, for example, the inner may be catch the integer, outside may be catch a JSON. And then if you throw inside your program, if you throw JSON, then it will actually skip this, this catch it would directly go to the outside. Okay, so, so catch in def definition is essentially the closest catch routine or catch function matching the data type about that throw statement. So, so by the way, the throw statement has to match with the data type. That's why throw a string is going to go to a string. Throw an integer is going to do an integer. By the way, you can throw anything. You can throw JSON. You can throw whatever uh, object. You can throw a GPS location, for example. You can throw anything. It's just matching the, the function signature about the catch. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, all right. Any other question? Great question, by the way. Thank you. Yes. What if it's not a nested try statement, but you're still trying to throw two objects at the same time? Say that again? <laughs> like, you know how on the previous example, you're trying to throw a string and then an integer? What if you're trying to throw two integers? If you want, okay. Okay. Great question. 
What's your name again? Titan. OK, thank you, Tyson. Great question. So assuming we do this, um, assuming I actually change this to be throw whatever, uh, another, I, assuming I threw another call, uh, in, integer i, OK? Assuming I, I actually throw this instead of throw the, the string, right? So in this particular program, um, I encounter that integer, that first integer first, OK? So I'm actually going to be still catched by this one. And the second catch, sorry, the second condition that's going to throw, that particular program doesn't even uh, uh, being executed. So essentially, I stop my execution of any code within this try clause, stop right after I execute the throw. So any code after this throw will not be touched. Okay, well, I, I said your question, I really like it, but is that a good design? It might not be a good design, right? For example, if my goal is try to catch only the first exception or first error in the code, then this design is okay. But if my goal is to catch under a safe condition, catch every single exception within a block of code at one shot, then this is a bad design because it only catch the first one. Okay, so, so now we have a two design. One is I only catch the first one, but the other one is I actually catch, I want to catch multiple ones. This depending on the semantic or requirement of the program. For example, this if this program is for security, if I realize the program, my system has already been compromised, then I better stop immediately. Or I, I, I might actually, because the program is already in the unstable state due to that exception I, I detect, if I continue SQ, I might make the problem even worse, depending on the situation. But if, if, if assuming, say, this is, this is not safety related, I want to actually be able to, so when you interact with, uh, with, uh, um, with, uh, um, with a server, and the server asks you to fill in all your personal information. Okay, your birthday, your password, your user ID. So you actually make like a 20 mistake in that form you submit. So in that case, I would like the server to catch all the exception, all 20 of them, and send back to the client at one shot so I can fix all 20. What I don't want is, okay, I fixed the first one, and, and guess what? The next time I submit, it said, hey, there's another error. And it's like a 20 times. I have to fill in the same information 20 times. So that's a bad design. So depending on the situation, you want to have a, all of them or one that, but if you follow, it's either battery problem. Or, okay, I'm just going to speak aloud, okay? So, but this particular design of the code is actually going to um, uh, only catch the first one. Okay, so let me actually ask you, since you guys asked this question, I want to ask you, how do I rewrote this code, rewrite this code, such that I can catch both? How do I rewrite this code? I can actually catch both. <clears throat> because you see that in all four cases, I actually, cannot catch both. I can only catch the first one. How do I remove this code? Yeah. Can you just list the catches? <clears throat> but that means I have to break my try, right? I have to break my try into multiple component, which is hard, right? Because I don't know how many condition I, I have, okay? Okay, so this is a little bit advanced. You will see this techniques being used a lot in exceptional handling, the, the practical exceptional handling. So typically, let me actually 
tell you the high level and then we'll see the code in, in detail. So what I can do is this. Let me do this. Let me actually create an object called JSON. Let me create an object called JSON. And then when I have this, instead of throw new pointer, I'm going to say J uh, uh, catch one. is equal no pointer. <clears throat> okay, over here, I'm just writing what I want to display as the, the information into a JSON. I say J catch one, no pointer. And then over here, I'm actually going to say, hey, J, um, J, uh, I would say catch two is equal to hex index. Okay, I have a two. And then at the end, at some place, I would say if J not null, meaning that this JSON has some information, which means that there are some, I don't know exactly which one, but before I reach this point, there are some exception that has been catched by this JSON J. If this is a, I'm going to throw J. Okay, in this case, I actually need to have a catch of a JSON J, like this. Okay, I, I, will, I will do this if I know I want to catch all the exception in one shot. And then I want the exceptional handling routine to handle all of them. So essentially you can see that now the, the this function, it will receive the information about all the exception above this try that you will, would like to catch in one shot. Of course, you can still have other things, but this, this is a particular one that you want to actually do. I mean, this is a typical way. That's why sometimes um, uh, JSON is com very convenient because you can actually shuffle a lot of information with different type, and then you will be able to uh, throw at one time. Okay, does that make sense? You can, you can do this. Okay, so now let's actually look at the more complicated example. <clears throat> Okay, so we talk about this. So typically, um, so we already give you three keywords. One keyword is try, throw, and catch. So the other thing which is important is the data type about the throw and the catch. So how do you actually match the throw and the catch is based on whatever the data type. And typically, uh, a, in a more sophisticated uh, exceptional handling routine is pretty much always this is an object. It's not an integer. I mean, if you throw an integer, what kind of information you're giving? It's just one integer. And typically you want somebody to handle your exception, you better give more information about what caused that exception, where this exception is actually occurring and under what context we're talking about. So there is usually a lot of information we need to transfer from the exceptional point to the point where you actually catch. So typically what we have is that if you want to write a decent exception handling code, you typically need to allocate an object from the beginning. You have this object created. And then when you are executing, you actually fill in the content. For example, you have to say, hey, I'm processing line 237, or this is a function I just passed. And then eventually you fill in the content for the object. And at one point you actually realize, okay, now I'm, I, I, I'm ready, I'm mature, that I need to pass on uh, to another point. So then you can say throw object, and then this, this yada catch routine will catch that. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's that's a typical uh, flow. So think about not just three keywords, but think about what information I should actually write it down over here. The important thing I want to show you in the slide is, <clears throat> so always think about what information to pass on, okay? That is something which is uh, a, a key to a nice design about exceptional handling. What information you want to give other people to, to process, okay? All right, so now let me give you some interesting example. So I have a function number one, function F1, which has a, a tri clause. I mean, the programmer number one, he designed uh, F1, which is have this, this, this particular format. I hope you're okay following whatever the paradigm I have in the, in the previous one. Okay. And now I'm actually doing this. I'm doing a throw inside the catch. What do you think I'm doing over here? So now this is the first time I'm actually have a basic try, throw, and catch. And now I'm actually doing the throw. Remember I said, I really want somebody else to take care of the code. And somebody else to take care of code typically is not in the F1 because I actually roll F1. I roll F1 and I want somebody else to take care of the code. So that's why, and sometimes I can actually throw in the catch because this first level catch is maybe it's just for uh, uh, something I handle internally, but I actually want somebody else to take care of code. So I actually will do a throw in that catch routine. So essentially it means that whatever call F1 is going to receive the throw. So the, the, the flow char will look like this. So I have a upper function, which is, I actually have a, some kind of, I create a new object called E object, exceptional handling, and I'm going to call F1. And then I actually catch this E object here and I filled in, and then I actually throw E object. Sorry, the, the, I catch whatever F1 give it to me, but I'm going to put whatever F1 give it to me put it into E object, and then I'm actually going to uh, uh, throw it to whatever is upper than that, okay? So this is showing an example. You could have <clears throat> multiple layer of function that you can communicate with each other with the catch and throw. So in this case, you can see that F1 maybe just detects some arrow, but it cannot handle, it will just, continue to give it to the upper level and let upper level to handle that, okay? And in fact, it, it works this way. So in the upper level, it actually called two function. So I, I the, 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 a typical code is you're not going to just call one function, you're calling multiple function. So in this case, you can see that F upper, I kind of have a one try catch clause for function one. And then after I finish that, I have a, a second function, which is F2 and E object two. But remember the exceptional object E object was actually created at the beginning. So essentially I have an E object, which is an exceptional object. It's supposed to collect all the exceptional information from all the function I call and put it in a single place. And then eventually I throw, so, which means if you look at this code, F upper, you actually see that you must have an, another function, which is your main program. So your main program is going to call F upper, and the F upper is going to call F1 and F2, and F1 and F2 individually, they're going to catch certain things. So in this picture, you can see you have a multiple layer, and you also decentralize the checking of the condition about the logic to different functions. So who is, which part of the code is actually checking the original uh, exception? It's really F1 and F2. F1 and F2 is checking the lowest level of information. And then the information somehow get 
aggregate in F upper. So F upper, if you look at the structure, is actually the same as I actually talk about here. <clears throat> So F upper is like a this. You see that I have a two different uh, condition I want to catch. So I create a JSON at the beginning, and then at the end, I just throw the JSON. So it's, you can think about the first one, object pointer null is function one. And the second one, text index smaller than zero is function two. I can actually make a function instead of having everything here. So I kind of decentralize my logic. I also decentralize my exceptional handling, exceptional detection, and handling the me mechanism into different functions. And which then you will you will actually move on to have this picture. So so the most important picture that you need to learn today is is this diagram. So this diagram actually show a fairly sophisticated style of writing exceptional handling. So, so the exceptional handling, number one, you can have multiple layer. So you basically let each of the code doing that particular pieces about the detection. And then you will see that you have a tri class almost everywhere. Because why? They're actually related to each other. Try and catch. They're related to each other. And you want them to work together you have to actually put in this try and catch with whatever data type so they can go there. Okay, the other thing I, I forgot to mention. Okay, by the way, before I go to the next scenario, any question with this picture? <clears throat> yes. Um, Which one? Try. F upper, I do have a try. You see I have a try and then catch for the first one. And I have a try and catch for the first one, for the second one. But okay, I, I guess your your I know your question. So you actually say, hey, I do a throw here, right? But I it's not within the try. Great, great point. Okay, I, I make a mistake. Sorry, Carlos, right? Carlos, Carlos pointed out my mistake. What's my mistake? Or 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 what's the resolution about? The, the the concept that I said throw must be within the try, right? What's the problem? What did I what did I miss? <clears throat> this is a combination of both of your questions. You're asking, you know, who is going to catch, right? When you do a throw, how do you control? In this case, if I do try, what will happen? Oh, sorry, if I do throw, what will happen? Okay, there are two cases. Exceptional handling is either something uncaught. Something called caught or uncaught. I, I'm going to show you a program which show you why sometimes it could be uncaught, okay? Um, Let me let me actually write this program very easily. Yeah, let's do um, okay. For those participation credit, I'm going to turn off the server for a while. I'm actually going to run the midterm. I mean, you're going to use your midterm to 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 deal with this problem. Where is the midterm? <clears throat> okay, so here is a midterm and look at the client. Okay, I have I have this I have this uh, uh, mechanism and uh, let's let's try to try to run it. Okay, let me try to run it. So I have two climb h w three location h w three question. 
Okay, so here you can see that at the end, because I didn't run, I, I intentionally, I didn't run the server. So I'm actually going to get the exception saying that, hey, uh, this cannot, could not uh, connect to the server. Okay, that, that's the that's exception. But now I'm going to do this. I'm going to modify, uh, sorry. Okay, over here, you see that I'm actually trying to run upload, okay? See that I have a try. I have a try and catch. Because guess what? I don't have a throw. See that? I don't have a throw in here. So let's actually remove this file. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. And get rid of this. Essentially, I get rid of a try and catch and put those two pieces of code, two lines of code, naked. I'll, I'll show you why I said this code is naked. Now I do a make. Now I run the code. Okay, in fact, number one, you see that I actually have a runtime error for a board. It's not exception. This is almost as bad as a segmentation board. Okay, but look at the message. He said, libc plus plus ADI terminating due to, what's this two word? Uncaught exception. You see why is uncaught? Because inside that two piece of code, I have, the potential generate the exception, but I remove the try and the catch. That means, okay, my code is actually not ready to receive the, the throw. And therefore I'm going to get this error. You see that the difference between this two line is because of, of the uncaught exception. Okay, so let's move it back. <clears throat> let's look at that piece of code. Okay, this piece, of, you, you see that the second piece, the question, I still have try. So that's why I only see, if you remove this try, we'll see another uncaught exception. Okay, it's probably won't see that because it will it will probably abort already. So this one is somebody else is actually doing that. I have to catch it. So that's why it's important in C++ program is that when you use other people's code, such as JSON, RPC, whatever, you have to know what kind of exception it will generate. Because when the things are doing good, you don't need to worry about that, right? If everything is good, they won't throw anything at you. But you can think about this is like your protection, the try catch clause is like your protection. You have to put it in such that you have the armor when somebody throw you as, as, as a stone called JSON RPC exception, and you, you have a way to catch that. Okay, so that, that's actually uh, uh, important. So, okay, okay, I'm using this example. Now let's actually go back to answer Carlos' question. So essentially what's happening, you probably see that I actually has that try and catch at the main function. So you can think about this is HW, HW3 ref2 client.cpp. This code, fmain, is that uh, HW3 uh, ref2. And this code over here in the middle is JSON RPC internal code. Okay, so JSON RPC internal code, they actually detect some condition. They basically do a throw and they're expecting the user of JSON RPC library, they will catch it. Okay, so, so that, that makes exceptional handling, you can, you can call it a blessing or a curse, is that you do need to aware of this. You do need to aware whenever you use somebody else's code, you actually need to know what kind of things is going to throw at you. Okay, so you have to, you have to realize that. Okay, however, we learned the concept called single inheritance. So let me, let me actually tell you a good news before I tell you even more bad news. Okay, I want to dis I want to encourage you before I dis discourage you. Okay, so I'm I'm just joking. All right, so um, there is something I, I kind of skip called a uh, uh, a standard exception. So this is a, a standard uh, exception class called uh, include everything, 
called class exception and the the JSON RPC exception inherit the exception from STD exception. Okay, so they have an inheritance relationship. So they have an exception and then they have a RPC exception. So the catch and throw also will be covered by inheritance. All right. So so for example, I don't know what kind of thing is going to throw at me. I don't know if it's JSON. I, I don't want to worry about JSON RPC. So I can do this. By the way, I can do this. I can do STD exception. You see that because it's going to throw me a JSON RPC exception, but JSON RPC is the derived class. The base class is what? STD exception. So now I can actually do this. So now I'm actually going to run the code again. You see, it's again, exception. Again, it's, it's I'm using a different one to catch that one. Okay. So um, so now I'm going to give you a little bit of tricks to do this. Think about this. Um, this is this is a very important example. I hope you pay attention to what I what I just what I'm going to show you. So uh sorry. So I'm going to have a both of them. I'm going to have both. JSON RPC exception. I have another catch, which is STD exception. And but the first one, I'm going to show have the same code over here and here. Okay, but here I'm going to print STD C out I am JSON RPC exception backslash n. Okay. And then over here, I'm going to show, I just want to differentiate which one I'm calling. I'm a STD exception. <clears throat> okay, so I have a two catch. They're actually catching exception, but this two, the type they're catching is basically base class and derived class. Okay, so my question is in my previous example, when I have the throw is actually throwing a JSON RPC exception, which one do you think it will it will be catched? The standard one or the JSON RPC one? You probably can guess it is actually the one that's actually closest to the type that it will throw. So in this case, because you're throwing JSON RPC exception, regardless of the order, okay? It will match this better than this one. Okay, so it's, a, it's, it's matching the type has to match, but within the inheritance hierarchy, it will go to the lead, whatever is the most derived class. So let me just, just actually try to run it. <clears throat> I have arrow, okay, it doesn't allow me to do that. What's the arrow? Ah, thank you, thank you. So I thought I misunderstood the concept of exception again. So yeah, by the way, uh, is as a programmer, even I have done programming for a long time, uh, it's, it's always I learn something new when I really try to realize or implement the concept I thought it was for object the program. It's always modify the program, Whenever I mo remove something, to be honest with you, I always have a doubt in my mind whether this will cause error. Okay, but I, I want to pass on that, that philosophy to you. Don't trust other people. Don't trust your instructor. Don't trust yourself unless you write a program and compile it and see the program will generate the output exactly what you expect. Okay. Thank you, Berg. Wait, wait a minute. I have another one.
What is this? Okay. Let me see. Oh, I've got one more. Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Now I got it. So catch is like this. I have one more. Okay. I, I actually should write it this way. I mean, it's, it's just a style issue. Okay. So now I'm happy. Now it should be happy. Okay, so now I'm running the program again. <clears throat> you see that it's actually still have this two exceptional handling routine. Do you see that? It said it prints out the, the message say I am JSON RPC exception, which means that this actually go into that particular more specific exceptional handling function. Okay. So 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 through this example, you see that this has to match the type. It has to use the type or associate with a catch routine. That's a closest match, okay, to that routine. Okay, any question? Okay, now let's get back to this picture. Okay, so this 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 figure you can see that I have some function somewhere is actually doing some functionality I expect them to handle, and then the result will be aggregate as some middle function which has the um, the whatever the object that's actually going to uh, uh, get the throw, and then eventually. Uh, there is an upper function, which is basically catch everything, and then it will do processing. Okay, so, so this is a typical scenario for us to basically have a system of program handling all kinds of exception. If, if you understand this particular um, um, diagram, you probably catch already the most important uh, concept that in this, in this uh, chapter. Okay, any question? Okay, so now let's actually look at the difference between STD exception and the RPC exception. I want you to see the difference and then I will motivate you why we need to design our own exceptional handling. <clears throat> Okay, there was, um, this is a basic STD exception. That's the interface. Um, and by the, by the way, there are a bunch of uh, standard exception, we call the standard uh, runtime arrow that's being catched by the system library. Uh, for example, the first one is STD bat alloc. So this is a STD bat alloc which means that it is a, um, um, a bad memory allocation. Okay, somewhere has a bad memory allocation. Um, so that is basically inherent from STD exception. Okay, by the way, the code I wrote over here makes sense in this, in, in, the, following, in the following way. <clears throat> So remember I wrote a code which has a JSON RPC exception and then I have a STD exception, standard exception. So if within this two piece of code, if it has RPC exception, it will be catched by the first one, JSON RPC exception. But within this code, there is a bad memory allocation. It will be actually catched by the second catch clause. Okay, so having this, is actually a better protection because there are, there are some exception which is follow STD exception, but they are not RPC exception. Okay, so, so in the code, in fact, I feel this is actually stronger than the one I actually present to you in the midterm or HW3 ref2, okay? All right, so let's come back. <clears throat> okay, this is a standard exception. Take a look at the interface. Of the of this exception, standard exception. These two are constructor. You can do constructor. 
and you have a destructor. And the only thing that's actually going to be really important or the only thing available is what we call what. So what is what? What basically just allow you to display a string. Just basically say, hey, what is the nature of the of the uh, exception? For example, uh, you will say bad memory allocation. It's just a string to tell you that, hey, this is a bad memory allocation, or this is a, uh, a range error, or this is an underflow, whatever. Okay, so it basically just put you a string. So the only function that's really matter in the exception is just a message, which is represented as a C string. Do you see the problem? It's, a, it's, it's really restricted. You think about that, the exception could be a lot of information. The exception could be where this information happened and what attribute or what class or what other information and what you only hear is that, hey, this is a particular type error. So the problem is this, this is a very generic, but it's really didn't give you much information because it's only give you a string. Whatever you want to do, you have to encode it in the string, whatever is somebody else code, by the way. <clears throat> so let me actually show you the, the design about JSON RPC exception. So by the way, in my, in a Linux environment, if you go to, <laughs> user local uh, JSON RPC CPP common slash exception. You was you should see this code in my machine. I think it's under. Let me actually go check. Okay, it should be more slash opt slash homebrew. Uh, include JSON RPC. CPP, and then I will say common, and then exception .h, okay? So this is on my machine. You can see that this is a definition that pretty much I show it in the, in the screen, okay? This is a class, JSON RPC exception. You see that it inherit publicly from uh, STD exception and has a bunch of uh, uh, constructor and then has a destructor and the destructor is a virtual. Okay, that's interesting. Destructor is a virtual. Think about that, why is that? And then they have an extra function. They, they uh, by the way, it's inherent, so it has a what? Okay, it has that what already, but it has like a get code, the get message and get data. Okay, it has some information, some inter allow you to get more, but look at the private data. It has extra information, like uh, what is the code, what is the message, what string, data, and the data is what? Data is, is what? It's a JSON value. So essentially, you can code almost everything into that data, okay? Uh, and and with, with uh, whatever uh, message you want to have, okay? So this design compared to the STD exception, this one is much richer in terms of you can actually provide more information. <clears throat> Any question about this? So let me tell you what I don't like about this. Okay, what I don't like about this. Okay, maybe may, before I tell you why I don't like this, I want you to think about what might be the issue with this particular design. <clears throat> what might be the issue? The issue, maybe it's not an issue, but maybe it is, is that all this variable are private. All this variable are private. So let me ask you, if you look at the whole code, when can I change those objects? those content. For example, I have a one variable for JSON value data. If it is private, which means that I cannot change it easily, you have to give me interface to change that, right? It's a private. So now, can you tell me, look at this piece of code. I mean, pretend we're doing midterm, okay? I'm showing you this design. When can you change the data in this RPC JSON object? Yes.
Exactly. This line here, right? This line. If you look at the whole, thank you very much. That's exactly right. The only place for the design of the JSON RPC exception is that line. You don't have any other line to change. You can get the information, but you cannot set it. So which means what's that line? That was a constructor. That was a constructor. So meaning that you can only insert the data at the time you construct the object, the exceptional object, right? But after you construct the object, you no longer can change the data. That's a design. That's a design. Okay, so this might or might not be a problem. Let me actually tell you why. So remember, we have this logic. Let me actually show you this logic. <clears throat> Let's go back to my favorite example. Look at the inner part. I create, let me actually just, just take this part. Let's look at this. What? I cannot copy it. Okay. I want to get rid of you. I want to get rid of you. <laughs> Okay, so you, you see that I'm actually creating a E object at this moment. I constructed, and then what I did is that I, this assuming this is a JSON RPC exception. And now I'm actually, when I process F1, I want to catch, but I catch means that I want to append some information into that data. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. Why? Because the data is actually being, uh, uh, I can only modify the data at the time I create the object. So the only choice I have is I actually need to extract whatever data is there in the original object and I create a second object. Because of that design, because that data is only allowed to modify at the creation time. So therefore, what I have, I have no choice. I can read the E object, but I cannot modify. So I have to read the original content and then write it into that. So what, I mean, the most critical is the second one because the second one, suppose at the end of the result, the exceptional object need to have all the exception I collected from both F1 and F2. Assuming both F1 and F2 have something, which means that I have to recreate F1 E object, I have to recreate E object for F2 to combine. I kind of have to combine this outside of the box and then recreate it. And then I can actually get the things I want. So that's actually my complaint about that design. So it's the design was actually created by some really, really good programmer. But I think when they do the design this way, <clears throat> When they designed it this way, wait a minute, where is my code? Yeah, here is a code. <clears throat> when they designed it this way or whatever this way, you can see that the, the mindset of the particular programmer is only thinking about creating an exception for one shot. They're not thinking about appending. They're not thinking about, I can modify the exception when I actually have that. And which which is an important lesson. I, I I mean, by the way, this is a subject, most of the object-oriented programming uh, uh, instruction, they usually don't, don't really, really teach you that this important lesson is that you have to think about this in a systematic way. And then you can construct this, this in the design that you have to think about, well, how do I actually use this fully with its comprehensive power that I can actually use this as a collection mechanism for all the problem in my system at one shot. And then you have to make this, uh, um, uh, if you design this to be private and then you provide the interface that doesn't allow me to modify, it's a bad design. Okay, so now we see both. 
one is standard exception. It doesn't give us anything. It just give us a string. And the RPC exception, which offer us another example, is they really designed for one shot. If you know what you're doing, one arrow, you can put it in easily, but you want to have a multiple arrow, sorry, you have to do a lot of extra work. You can still make it to work, but it's hard. Okay, so that's why we actually need to design our own. That's why we have ECF36B exception, which I want to show you it is. Uh, oh, I'm running out time perfectly, but I want to just show you very easily, uh, very quickly before I started my lecture on, um, so this is this is the ECF36B exception. It has been there, but I want you to actually take a look at this. So I have the first class called exception information, which I actually have a four attribute, where, what, which, and how. It represents a lot of information about when and the attribute and the class and the object information is over there. And that's, that's, and I overload, of course, a operator uh, um, um, assignment, which which I basically say, the fourth piece of information represent location, which class, what means the error content and which attribute and also which function pointer. So basically provide a, a very, very rich content for us to handle variety of exception. But the, the interesting part is the class called ECS36B exception, which is inheriting from the public standard exception. And see what I did is I use a vector. So I have a vector of ECS exception info, which is the, what is the exception info? It's actually above. I just talk about what, where, how, and which. And so this design is, and, and remember, this is not necessarily the good thing all the time, but I think for this context, it makes sense. I make it public. I make it public, which means that people can append their new exception into this array. And then I have a bunch of other things, including my what. I actually kind of doing what differently, but I'm including all the dump to JSON uh, business over there as well. So mean, means that I will talk about this and how this is going to be really, really important, useful in the code that I put it there already in the master directory. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I will continue this on um, next Tuesday. You have a good weekend. And the homework is due tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. So today's office hour is your last chance to get some help. <laughs>